All right. Well, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to start this series, as we've, we've said already, a series on expansion, and I'm going to carry it right into Missions Month, into October. Matthew chapter 13, what we're going to find here in Matthew chapter 13 is Jesus telling some parables, and I specifically want you to go to verse 31. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 31, it says, He, speaking of Jesus, put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches." He told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. I want to talk to you today about expansion. And the idea is that the kingdom of God is something that expands. Jesus came to earth and he talked frequently and often about his kingdom. A kingdom that he said was coming, and on another occasion, he said, is now here. The kingdom he spoke of was his kingdom, the kingdom of God. When Jesus spoke of the kingdom, he was revealing that he had come to take back the reins of authority on earth, his authority over all man to be their king, and them to be members of his kingdom. He told his disciples, he said, pray like this, God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus would preach and he would teach more about the kingdom than any other subject. And if you pay close attention to every subject he he taught, you will likely see him showing how the world's ways contrast to his kingdom. God's kingdom plays by a different set of rules. And Jesus was always teaching and showing how God's ways stood in stark contrast to ours. The way we treat others, the way we spend our money, the way we make our money, the relationships that we have, the moral behavior, our thinking. Jesus had this incredible knack of showing the people that there was their way and then there was the kingdom way. Whenever Jesus would speak of the kingdom and its ways, he would imply that the kingdom was to be contagious. It was meant to spread, to grow, to move, to go, to expand. God himself came in the form of Jesus, not to just teach or preach on the kingdom, but to reveal the kingdom, to show man what the kingdom looks like, acts like, is like, the king of kings was made flesh to dwell among the people of the earth. Then through the miracle that only God could do, Jesus made a way for his kingdom to dwell in us. When the kingdom gets inside a believer, God describes that believer is like a light or salt in the world. Two dynamic things that change their environment. When we turn the lights on, things look different. Everything becomes a little easier to see. What seemed dark and maybe it looked just like shadows becomes clear to us. It becomes easier to get work done. It's less scary in the light. It's less threatening in the light. Salt affects everything that it comes in contact with. It, it, it specifically affects the taste of things. It also preserves food. It's a valuable item in society and has been since the times of Jesus. The believer is to be light and we are to be salt. We are to affect the world in which we live. Why? Because the kingdom was designed to expand. Jesus wants to expand his territory, his reach, his touch, his influence. And you and I, we are the vessel that he uses to expand it. In Matthew chapter 13, we find Jesus in the height of his ministry. He is famous. Word has spread about him and his miracles. Every place he goes, the crowds are following him. And on one day, on one day, the crowds follow him down to the sea. 
And as he often did, he got into a boat and he pushed away from the shore, probably to, to, to allow his, his voice to carry as he began to preach and as he began to teach. And on this day, the Bible tells us that he began to tell many parables. Parables are stories. Stories told because they have deeper meaning. Sometimes people understood the parables and sometimes they didn't. Sometimes Jesus would explain the meaning and sometimes he left it a secret. Every speaker has a different way of teaching and preaching and parables was Jesus' way. Jesus begins to share and explain some of the parables. But what you and I need to know today for the sake of this message is that each of the parables on this particular day, each one in Matthew chapter 13, were in reference to the kingdom of heaven. A few minutes ago, I read to you two of the parables. The first one found in verses 31 through 32. It's the parable of the mustard seed. Chances are good. You've heard it before if you've been in church for any length of time. It, 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 you've probably heard about the mustard seed. Jesus says it's small here, but it's a really, really extremely small seed. It's super small, and Jesus referenced the kingdom as being like this seed. Even though the mustard seed is so small, it has incredible potential. When planted, it grows into a tree, a tree that has the potential to reach heights of 15 to 20 feet in a perfect environment. And I know that's no oak tree, but in Jesus' region and in regard to the size of the seed, that's a good size tree. The kingdom is supposed to expand like that. When the kingdom is planted in the heart of a person, the potential for its reach should be incredible. Let me ask you a question. What's the most common enemy of a seed? You can probably think of some. I've thought of two. The first one was not being planted. A seed that is never planted never has the chance to reach its potential. It can't expand unless it is put in the soil. The kingdom must get into the heart of man to have any chance to expand. Birds, I thought of, were the second enemy of a seed. Birds love to eat seed. My parents live in a, in, in a wooded community, and they have bird feeders outside of, of pretty much every window, I think. And and, and, and you watch these birds all day long and they come and they annihilate the seed and they love the seed and they eat the seed and, 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 and birds love to eat the seeds. And Jesus said this, it is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nest in its branches. It's interesting that the very creature that is the enemy of the seed will find safety in its expansion. Not only safety, not just rest, but they will make their nest, the Bible says. They will find a home in the kingdom. This is the beauty of God's kingdom. When you were an enemy of God while you were still sinning, God himself knew your sin and he came and he made a way. He died on a different kind of tree, a cross, and the kingdom was expanded and made available for you to have a home. Not as the enemy of God, but as a child of God. That's the beauty of the expansion of the kingdom is that as the kingdom expands, ones who are enemies of it become children of God and belong in it. I'm so thankful for the kingdom. I'm so thankful that I found a home in the kingdom, that I found a home in the saving grace of Jesus. The kingdom of God is about expansion. It does not stay where it is. It expands. Expansion means the action of becoming larger or more extensive. The kingdom is supposed to expand in you. The kingdom is supposed to grow in you first. You are the good soil for the seed of the kingdom to grow. Before the kingdom grows in your environment, it must expand in your heart. It has to shape your heart and your thinking and your 
actions. The root system needs to begin to wrap their grip around your desires, your hopes, your dreams, your passions, your future. It's a lot like if you're in a married relationship and, and, and maybe things aren't going so good right now. Maybe you're not seeing eye to eye. Maybe there's some tension in your relationship or maybe it's always been that way and you're wondering how in the world do I get to a place where my married relationship is thriving and growing as God designed it to be. Can I tell you, it's when you take the word, when you take the uh, seed of the kingdom and you plant it in your heart. It's when you begin to read in the word about the seeds that God gives to us for our marriages and you begin to read about how you're to serve and how you're to respect and how you're to honor and how you're supposed to lift up the other person and how you're supposed to draw them to Christ and all of these different things and you begin to read about them those are seeds and you plant those seeds in your heart but you can't just read about them and 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 put them in your heart you have to water them and take care of that seed and how you do that is by thinking about it and dwelling on it and thinking, how can I care for this seed? What can I do in regards to my relationship with my spouse, in regards to this word that God has given me? How can I nurture it? How can I serve? How can I honor? How can I respect? What can I do to love my spouse as Christ loves me, the church? What can I do? And as you think about it, as you water it, as you dwell on it, as you begin to imply some uh, action to it, what begins to happen is that word begins to take root in your heart. And as the word of God, the kingdom of God begins to expand in your heart, what happens is it expands and it begins to flow out. It begins to flow out of you. And what happens is your spouse is going to recognize this isn't the same person. This is not the Rob I saw yesterday. Something is different. What is different about this person and what should be different is that it's the kingdom of God coming out of you. This is the kingdom. It's the fulfillment of God saying, pray like this, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. When I allow the word of God to take root on the inside of me and I put some practice to it, what begins to happen is it flows out of me and God is able to bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven man when the kingdom gets deep in you then over time the reach begins to flow out of you how many of you know that when something good starts to grow there is an enemy that wants to stop the flow the enemy of the kingdom would love to shut it down The enemy of the kingdom would love to shut down your thriving marriage. Some of you in this room today, you've experienced the shutdown. Some of you in this room, you've experienced the end of the flow. The flow stopped. The grow stopped. There was a point in your life where you went through some devastating period of time when the flow stopped because the enemy was able to put a dampen on your relationship and what happened is you grew apart instead of growing together. You grew apart instead of growing stronger in your faith with Jesus. Come on, the enemy would love to stop the flow. The enemy of the kingdom would love to shut it down. In the parables Jesus would share, there was often a bad guy. Right? There was often a villain, an enemy. For example, when we read earlier in Matthew chapter 13 of the parable of the sowing of the seed, there was the people who trampled the seed. There was the weeds that grew up with the plant. And then there was the birds that ate the seed. They were all bad guys in the story. And they represented the ways that the enemy, the way that circumstances in our life, And the way that our own fleshly desires steal the seed of the kingdom from our hearts and our lives. God wants the kingdom to expand beyond us and affect others. But I want to take you to the next parable. And I want to show you one of the greatest, what I believe now to be one of the greatest strategies of the enemy to stop the flow when God wants the kingdom to grow. Jesus said this, he said, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. 
You know, I've learned something about Jesus, something that you probably wish as a pastor I was capable and able to do. Jesus is able to say a whole lot with one sentence. Jesus is able to say a whole lot with one sentence that, will, that I can barely even touch on in 45 minutes of speaking. Jesus can say in one sentence. I've learned that when it comes to Jesus and when Jesus says something in this book, we should pay close attention. I've learned that we should pay such close attention that we really dive into it. What is Jesus really saying? What is he saying that's beyond the surface? The closer you look, I've found, the closer you look at what Jesus says, the more amazed you become at who he is. He expands the revelation of who he is with every closer look. And I want to look at four things in this parable, this one parable, this one sentence parable, four things that I overlooked and four things that I never paid attention to before this week. As I began to study this message, it became clear to me that what I thought was clear and what I thought I was going to preach on about this parable, I didn't really understand. I want to look at four things in this parable and look at all four from the perspective of those who were hearing Jesus teaching that day on the beach, the Jews who were hearing Jesus as he taught these parables and shared these parables. I want to tell you about four things, the leaven, the woman, the word hid, and the three measures. Let's start with the leaven. Here's my non-scientific definition of leaven. Okay, I'm not a cook. It's all, it, it, it's old fermented dough full of bacteria and fungus. That's what it is. And, and this living organism in the dough causes it to grow overnight. And by the morning you have this entire dough that, that's risen. It sounds like that nasty healthy drink that people drink. That people tell you, make sure you get the one with the mother in it. You guys know what I'm talking about. That kabucha. This stuff's nasty, let me tell you. First time somebody tried to give me kabucha, I thought they had urinated in a bottle. I said, I'm not drinking that. That is some nasty, disgusting, it's so good for you, but make sure the mother's in it. What's the mother? A living bacteria. Make sure that's in it. You want to get that inside. You want to get that in your, that's going to clean you right out. Say, I got something living on the inside of me. He'll take care of everything. I have the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. I don't need your, man, I'll tell you. No, it probably is healthy for you, but I'm not drinking it. At first glance, this parable seems to mean that if you put a little bit of the kingdom inside something that it will expand and grow and permeate through the whole. And I always thought it meant that, but I'm not so sure anymore. And here's why. Leaven is used 22 times in the Old Testament and 17 in the New Testament. Forms of the word or references to it are found 88 times in the Bible. And if Jesus is referencing leaven in this parable as something positive, it will mean that one in out of 88 times the word leaven is used in a positive way in the Bible. One time out of 88. Meaning 87 out of 88 times leaven is referenced in the Bible as a bad thing. It wasn't that it was bad to necessarily cook with it under normal circumstances or, or, or that you couldn't have a meal with it. What it means is that the Bible often symbolized leaven as sin or evil behavior. 87 out of 88 times, if we believe this one time is different. Now why would God, who Hebrews 13.8 tells us is the same yesterday, today, and forever, reference it differently one time out of 88? We should pay attention. Look how Jesus used leaven in Luke 12, 1. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Jesus was warning about the sin of hypocrisy. He uses the example in Mark 8, 15. He says, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Jesus was warning against hypocrisy and also warning of the leaven of Herod. Herod was a self-indulging king. He was full of evil and sin. 
In Matthew 16, 5 through 6, Jesus said, watch out for the leaven of the Sadducees. What was the leaven of the Sadducees? They were extremely skeptical toward Jesus and his ministry, and they were also very critical people. They were very legalistic and treated people unfair. They put unrealistic expectations on others. Paul is no different. Look at what Paul says about leaven in 1 Corinthians 5, 6. He says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Paul referenced leaven just as Jesus does and the Old Testament did, and he describes it as sin. He said we are to be new. We're to be without leaven because Jesus made a way. There will be no leaven, no malice, no evil, no hypocrisy. You're a new batch. You're a new lump. Only in this sermon can I call you a new lump. I'll take advantage of it. You are a new lump. He says, a new lump. No leaven in you. Some of you have been in church a while, and you know the warning in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 15 through 16. The warning comes from Jesus, and he says, I know your works. You're neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. This is Jesus calling us to repentance when our actions are neither hot nor cold toward him. When we are riding the fence or teetering between good and evil. And did you know if leaven is too hot, it won't rise? And if leaven is too cold, it won't rise either. It's that perfect lukewarm temperature that causes it to rise. The second thing I want you to look at in Jesus' parable is the woman. The woman. Why did Jesus use a woman in his parable? Was he simply helping us to illustrate the parable because it was mostly women who cooked in his day and age? Was he implying somehow that women belong in the kitchen? I don't think so. I, do, I really don't. In the Bible, when women are mentioned in parables, they often represent a system of beliefs and practices that influence or dictate society. For example, they may represent a certain nation, a certain people group, a religion, an organization. Women typically represent more than one person when they're used in a parable because women symbolize reproduction. If a society was a powerhouse, it reproduced itself and it would be all about expansion. And that powerhouse may be described or be given the name of a woman. We still do it today when we speak of nations oftentimes. When we read of the prophetic words in Revelation and God speaks of nations, it oftentimes re reference them as the woman. It's not that it's a single person. It's a representation of a whole. And what did the woman do with the leaven? She took it, the Bible says. That word took means to seize in the Greek. And it says she took it and she hid it. She hid it. That word hid comes from the Greek word encrypto, which is our word for encrypt. Encrypto has the word crypto in it, and that means to cover up, to conceal to keep a secret or to be covert and not in a good way. With better understanding, as we read this parable, it seems that this parable that follows a good parable now reveals a parable about a bad guy. The bad guy is actually a bad woman or a bad system that has a hidden attack plan to corrupt the whole batch of good bread with a hidden secret weapon that needs to be encrypted so nobody knows about it. What is it that is hidden in the batch of good flour? Sin. The last thing I want you to see is the three measures of flour. To you and me, this really doesn't mean anything important. It meant a whole lot to the crowd that Jesus was talking to, though. It meant a whole lot when Jesus specifically said three measures 
of flour. See, to you and I, we might just think it was an everyday amount to make some bread. But the reality of three measures, if you were to take the measurements, that would be approximately somewhere between two and eight pounds of flour. Two and eight pounds of flour. I'm no baker. Trust me, don't ask me to cook you anything. Had this conversation with my, my boy yesterday. I said, buddy, you'd be in trouble if it wasn't for your mama. And he said, dad, you can make pancakes. I said, from a box? <laughs> he said, you can make peanut butter and jelly. I said, yeah, buddy, you got it. That's about it. That's all about all I got. I'm not a baker, but I've heard that it only takes about three cups of flour to make a loaf of bread. So what in the world was this woman doing with, with all of this flour? How much bread was she really going to make? I mean, it, it could have been, up, it could have been uh, 11 or 12 loaves of bread. It could have been upwards of enough bread to feed 100 people. I know it doesn't catch our attention when we say three measures, but it certainly would have caught the Jews' attention. Three measures meant a lot to the Jewish people when it came to making bread. Three measures was the amount of bread that Abraham, the father of their nation, had asked Sarah to make for the angelic visitors when they had come to visit them at their tent in Genesis 18.6. Three measures was the food offering that Abraham had given to them. Three measures is the amount used in baking the shoe bread for temple of the Lord. Three measures was the amount Gideon made in his offering to the Lord in Judges 6, 18 through 19. Three measures was the same amount Hannah made for her thank offering in 1 Samuel 1, 24. Three measures is the amount described in Ezekiel 45 and 46 in reference to an offering made to God. Three measures was a unique number that they recognized as an appropriate amount to celebrate, to welcome, to thank, and to give as a gift to someone. Whether that someone be God, or that someone be your neighbor, or that someone be a visitor who stopped in from a long trip, it wasn't a normal daily amount of bread to make. It was an amount that signified a special occasion. It was a special gift that was given. When, 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 when somebody says, I'm making a cake, you don't say, oh, it's a day like every other. You say, what's the occasion? When somebody says, I'm making a pie, you say, what for? Because most people don't make pies every day. If you do, I want to be your friend. <laughs> most people don't make cakes every day. Unless you do it for a living. It's a special occasion when Jesus said this woman had three measures of flour. It meant to the Jews, this is a special occasion. She is making a gift. It's going to be a gift. Three measures would have made them think of the meal offerings found in Leviticus chapter 2. Specifically, Verse 5, and if your offering is a grain offering baked on a griddle, it shall be of fine flour unleavened mixed with oil. This was called the grain offering. It was a way to sacrifice to God when someone may not have had animals to use. It was an offering to prevent his wrath, but also considered a thanksgiving offering. People would give grain offerings to kings as well. We see it when our when an offering was given to King David, it was a, a, a measure of three. It was a three-measure offering when it was given to him. It, it was done that way because that's how Abraham did it. When a grain offering was made to God, there was to be no leaven in it. Often in the meal offering to someone, you would leave the leaven out as well. It would have been an insult to put it in because that would be like saying, I'm giving you this gift, but there's sin in it. I mixed in a little evil. I put a little malice in it. I got a little lie in there, a little grudge, a little bitterness a little unforgiveness. I made sure to get in that extra little jab and make sure I'm always one up on you. But it's a gift. Here you go. You don't want sin in your gift, evil in your offering. 
Paul said, let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The festival is us celebrating each other, the celebration with each other. And we celebrate each other, not with malice and evil, but with sincerity and truth. Leaven works by breaking up, disintegrating, and corrupting the lump. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the bread of life and that his word is our daily bread. The enemy knows how to slow your grow and stop the flow, and he does it with sin. Specifically, sin towards God and sin towards others. There's no faster way to slow the expansion of the kingdom than with our sin toward God and towards each other. One of the greatest enemies to the kingdom expansion is the enemy within. If we are sinning against our brother, then we are the greatest enemies to the kingdom's expansion. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that Jesus is following up a beautiful parable about the expansion of the kingdom and how it's supposed to expand out of us and how it's supposed to reach out to the enemies of God and bring them into the kingdom with a pretty serious warning about the enemy to that. Be warned, not of a woman, but of a culture that you live in. One that doesn't want to stay out, but wants to get in. One that wants to influence, impact, and impart its leaven in your kingdom. Come on, did you hear me, church? Be warned. Jesus said the kingdom is like this. You know, it's, it's important that we understand that the kingdom is like this because Jesus was instructing in all of the parables, Jesus was instructing what the kingdom would be like here on earth. He was talking about what the kingdom would be like here on earth. And he says, be warned, the kingdom is supposed to branch out, it's supposed to expand, it's supposed to become a safe haven and a home for everyone. Even the enemies of God are supposed to come into its branches and nest there and make a home there. And then he says, but be warned, church, be warned that in the kingdom, if sin enters into the camp, it will leaven the whole bunch, the whole batch, mess everything else up. I wonder how much the leaven has seeped in to the church. I wonder how much the leaven has seeped into hearts, individual hearts. I wonder how much leaven has seeped into the kingdom here in our nation. I wonder how much leaven is seeped in, and if the leaven is the reason why the kingdom is not expanding like it should. I believe this is a warning from God. If you let it in, even just a little bit, a little lie, a little grudge, a little gossip, a little struggle, a little addiction, be warned, it will leaven the whole lump. Paul says this in Galatians 5, 7 through 10. He says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? In other words, he says, you were following Christ so well. The seed got in you. The seed was in you. You were in pursuit of the kingdom. You loved Jesus. You were running so good. You were were after God. And then he says something so significant. He says, who hindered you? Who did it? Who, who, Who let the leaven in? Who did it to you? This persuasion, he says, is not from him who calls you. You've been persuaded by the leaven. You've been persuaded. He says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. This is what he's trying to encourage this person. He says, you have taken offense. Somebody has come against you. And you're now against them. And now you're in this battle against each other. And what it's done is it's caused you to stop running this race so well. And what it's caused is it's called sin to come in. And isn't that what we do with each other? Is 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 we spread our leaven to each other. I think the prophet really nailed it home last week. 
I think Kenneth really hit home last week on Saturday night and Sunday night on how our offenses do this and how our struggles do this. And I had no intentions of preaching this this week like this until I began to study the word even deeper. And as I took a closer look, I said, wow, how in the world two weeks ago when I knew this is the direction that I was going to go and God would bring somebody in and preach this word and God would wait till he preached that word to reveal to me the whole revelation because I believe it's God's timing it's not just Rob's timing this seems like it fits good after this it's God's timing that says this is what I'm saying to my church don't let the leaven in don't let the sin stop people from running Paul picks up in verse 13 and he says for you were called to freedom brothers only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Wow, Jesus. The expansion of the kingdom has so much more to do with what gets in you. What's in you will determine what expands in the world around you. Paul addressed it here in Galatians just as Jesus did in his parable. And I gave you two parables today, one about planting and the other about hiding. I'm not sure about you, but after last week's message in ministry and after this week's revelation, there's nothing I want more than to have God's kingdom seeds planted in me. Deeper, more. I want more of the kingdom seed in my life planted there. I want to plant it there. And there's nothing I want more after this morning than for God to begin to reveal the hidden leaven. Show me the hidden places of my heart. Show me the hidden sins. Show me the things that I've held against my brother. Show me the things that I've done that I maybe did in secret. God, show me the hidden sin that I might not sin against you or sin against my brother. Help me. Reveal it to me. Why? Because God is able to forgive.